Good morning. My name is Ernie Humphrey. I'm the Vice President of Educational Programs for Performative, the online resource and community for corporate finance, accounting, treasury, and related professionals. First, I'd like to welcome everyone to the webinar, The Rolling Forecast, How to Transition and Leverage Best Practices. For businesses, rolling forecasts built upon driver-based and project-based planning create a framework that supports better decision-making processes across the enterprise. This webinar content will focus on how to define your company's objectives in creating a rolling forecast, best practice in analyzing the dynamics of revenues and expenses in your business, and how to, how to assess how external conditions impact your company's performance. I would like to thank Coast Analytics, whose commitment to thought leadership helps make this event possible for us this morning and free like everything else that we do on Performative. A quick note about today's agenda. First, we'll hear a presentation from our featured speaker from Host Analytics, and then we'll move into an interactive Q&A session where we will spend the remainder of our hour. We would like this to be an interactive experience for you, so if you have any questions at any time, please go to the questions area in your GoToWebinar control panel and send us your questions. We can't promise to get all of them in, but we'll do our best and we'll follow up afterwards on any questions we did not get to. A few more logistical notes about the webinar. A link to today's presentation and video of the webinar will be sent out to all attendees within 24 hours of the event and will be posted on performative.com for free download. Those who would like CPE credits through NASBA will need to answer all polling questions we have during the event and should have pre-registered for CPE credit prior to the webinar. For any questions on CPE credits, please contact Tanya Walsh at twalsh at performative.com. We'll also have her contact information available later in the webinar. You will be asked to take a short survey today regarding the webinar. We greatly appreciate your feedback regarding our event today. As we always strive to improve the ROI, we offer our event attendees for their valuable time. A quick word about Performative. Performative is the largest and fastest growing online community resource for senior level corporate finance, accounting, treasury, and related leaders. Performative connects corporate finance leaders to provide instant advice and insight on the tough financial and strategic challenges they face each and every day. Okay, let's get started by introducing our featured speaker, Brian Demler Buckley, Principal Product Manager, Host Analytics. Brian brings 13 years of experience in the corporate performance management software space to Host Analytics, serving in a number of different capacities. He's been an implementation consultant, the subject matter expert for engineering, critical customer success manager, and product manager for Hyperion Solution. Oracle after Oracle and Host Analytics. Prior to beginning his career in corporate performance management software, Brian led his accounting and finance, leverages finance and accounting background, working in public accounting and in finance for a global publisher. With that, it is my pleasure to hand the floor over to Brian, our featured speaker today. Brian, go ahead and take us away. Thanks a lot, Ernie, for that introduction, and thanks everybody for having me here today. We are going to uh, talk about uh, several things today, but the, the main uh, focus of the presentation uh, is around rolling forecasting. And it's at that stage uh, we really want to understand where we see finance uh, sitting today, meaning where, what is finance's role within the organization and how can finance leverage technology and specifically uh, certain processes like rolling forecasting to really put themselves not only in, a, in an excellent position to be part of the uh, decision-making process within an organization, but help to make all of the users that participate in the budgeting and planning processes much more efficient and effective. So I'm, I'm first going to start with uh, talking about finance's uh, evolving role. And uh, as you can see on the screen here, We've really got uh, a, a timeline here of, of how finance has been engaged within an organization. Traditionally in the past, uh, finance has really been seen as kind of the reporter of, of financial results, right? So doing, doing the reporting, dealing with the auditors, being uh, the, the go-to resource for figuring out uh, the questions around what happened, why did this happen, what happened to my data, where is uh, you know what? It, what is uh, what is the reason for the actual results that we're seeing? And uh, and pretty much they were dealing with rigid data, right? Uh, very controlled by systems that uh, either IT uh, managed and they had to make uh, requests for information, and or they were held in Excel spreadsheets and, and very hard to manipulate. And what we're we're seeing is that. Uh, 
this evolution is happening within the finance organization where they're becoming much more of a business partner. And what does that mean? That means that finance is, is involved in more of the decision making and setting the strategic direction for the company and having a seat at that table with, uh, with all the other strategic uh, partners within the organization. And the reasoning for that is because the role of finance is becoming much more proactive. It's less looking back into the past to determine what the trend was and, and then applying that same trend to the future, but looking more to the future around where do we want to be? Where do, where do we want to take this company and how are we going to get there? And, uh, and associated with that is establishing the processes that allow the company to get there. And the information that they're dealing with is much more real time. So they have the ability to look more into the future because the availability of the data is, is, uh, uh, is enhanced significantly, meaning there's no uh, spending the majority of the time gathering the data and, and just getting it into a format where we can pull it into a system and have some common look at it. The information is available at the fingertips and as such is available for uh, much more modeling and, and scenario building and what if considerations that uh, traditionally in the past there, there just wasn't enough time for. And lastly, you know, they've, they've become the, the driver of the business results. Uh, so through the flexible information that not only that they are receiving and being able to analyze, but also sharing across the organization, they are uh, the real driver behind uh, the actual business results within the company. So it's not just financial results, but it's financial results, it's operational results. Uh, that risk results, uh, you know, pretty much anything across the organization that, uh, that needs to be captured and reported on, finance is helping uh, lead that direction. And the reason that they are in such a central uh, role for that is because, uh, excuse all the clicks here, is because uh, technology is, an, is a significant enabler within this process. And finance is at the, the heart of enabling technology to get to this information and to, and to uh, provide that information across the organization to allow a lot more users to participate in the process. So we've also seen that, uh, you know, that finance executives are, their priorities are changing to some extent, right? We have the traditional uh, questions around, you know, I need to have access to my, to my business performance, right? And I need to understand as a uh, as a finance executive, how how do I get visibility into that? Additionally, you know, how do I become more of a business partner uh, with a functional executive? So uh, finance is the days of sitting in their central tower and, and just kind of talking from on high or or even just being considered uh, last in the line, depending upon the organization. You know, they they're they're much more integrated. They're much more um, involved in uh, the activities of the of the business. Uh, more so than they have in the past. And lastly, you know, finance is at the, the heart of the processes that are really driving the companies around, uh, you know, allowing them to execute on the strategic plan. Uh, the, the Wild West ways of uh, just letting everybody go off and kind of do their own thing, you know, divisions that had entirely different systems and or methodologies is, is, has been uh, abstracted. And now you have companies that are driving process throughout the organization to help them be much more efficient. And, and you see finance at the, the bleeding edge of that. And, um, you know, and what we hear a lot is, you know, how, how am I going to be involved in driving that fact-based decision-making throughout the entire organization? And, you know, as I mentioned, finance executives are saying that they want that traditional visibility into the corporate performance. But the key thing that's really changing is that they – they really want to be a, a partner in the overall organization and, and a partner in helping drive these fact-based decisions. And to that end, they're realizing that it's it's not just around process and, and affecting change within an organization, um, but it, it's also delivering vehicles and tools that will help uh, solidify those processes within the organization. So we, we've done uh, a few uh, studies ourselves uh, at, at Host Analytics, and, and uh, most recently we've done one of about 540 finance execs uh, to ask them some questions around, you know, how they saw the, the changing role of finance evolving. And we saw some pretty interesting results. 
And we've just got a couple of the snippets of what we found out here. And the, the key thing is, from a, from a CFO perspective, uh, the two-thirds of the CFOs that we, the, we queried indicated that they are much more involved in the strategic discussions than even just five years ago. So that's a huge shift in a short period of time, uh, which, which really shows the, the commitment uh, within companies to, to have finance as a, as a partner. Uh, around the strategic direction of the company. Now, some of the more interesting things uh, that we saw were that, you know, roughly a little bit over half say strategy and planning, and then roughly about a third say communication are the most important skills for CFOs. So strategy and planning, that's, that's probably not a surprise, right, because that's traditionally what finance has been involved with. But 30% uh, indicating that communication is the most important skill for a CFO is significant from the standpoint that you know, finance is involved in the discussion. They're, they're participating in the communication of processes and direction across all functional areas. And so this isn't just the CFO, but this is, you know, this trickles down to all of the other individuals within the finance organization that are continually communicating out with the, uh, the functional areas and other users within, uh, within the, uh, the organization to ensure not only that they are uh, adopting the processes that finance is putting in place, but also taking the feedback from those individuals and, and making modifications so that the processes continue to evolve. So those skills are, are really important. And kind of on the flip side of that, we thought it was really interesting to hear that, uh, that the CFOs were saying that financial reporting and, and accounting seem to be pretty low in terms of uh, priority list uh, around the skill set that is required to be a CFO. Now this this just shows the the evolution that uh, you know of the finance organization that it's not just about the abacus and cranking numbers out. It's about being much more strategic and and having that vision for the future and and uh, helping drive the company towards that. We've also uh, heard uh, as, as far as the the desire to have better planning processes that roughly three quarters of the individuals that we queried really wanted to have uh, those, those better processes and they felt that it would really give them a competitive advantage in the marketplace should they have those, you know, much more agile in terms of how they're uh, gathering their information and then making decisions based off of that. But unfortunately, the, the sophisticated planning approaches aren't, aren't really being adopted. So you consider scenario modeling, which is really just what if modeling, only a quarter of these uh, roughly 500 individuals are actually doing any of that in their planning process, right? So they're they're not considering those um, those uh, black swan events. You know, if if the market happened to take a nosedive, you know, what what impact would that have? Or if the European debt crisis continues to escalate or um, gets much more significant, what would happen? What happens if there's some kind of uh, currency devaluation in in a country that they do significant operations in? So all of those types of things. You know, they want to be doing, but they just are not participating in that. And so those are, these are significant findings and, and reasons for adopting technology to really get you to the, to the point where these become much more uh, available to you. So other things that we're hearing, uh, obviously we, uh, we are involved in a lot of implementations with our customers, and so we hear a lot of different things around what, what's keeping them up at night and what's prohibiting them from achieving a lot of these uh, a lot of these initiatives that they know they should be doing but they just can't get to and right now of course uh, we have things such as you know version controls broken links errors you know long nights where people are not really focusing their their activities most efficiently and uh, and, and that causes issues in, in rolling up information. And uh, if we consider the Excel world, that's certainly uh, a, a, an experience that most everybody has probably had at one point or another. Additionally, we have uh, the, the, abil the inability to, uh, from a reporting perspective, really get to the information that we want to. And, uh, and, that's, a, and that's a significant problem because at the end of the day, it's all about output. It's about getting information at, into the hands of the people that need to make the decisions uh, across the organization. So if we're not able to do that, we're not able to analyze the information, uh, whether that's through uh, production level reports or, or more ad hoc reports, then we're at a significant disadvantage. 
And as I mentioned previously, you know, the inability or, or difficulty with which uh, scenario modeling occurs today, you know, all of these processes contribute to uh, contribute to that that last stat, which says that we want to do this, but we just can't right now. And from a more from a uh, performance perspective, you know, not having the strategic strategic into you know the operations and finance um, budgets and plans is a significant uh, is a significant drawback to being able to really tie this uh, tie this together and help companies make more fact-based decisions. And lastly, you know, as I mentioned, operational decisions need to be tied in uh, with the uh, overall financial decisions that are being made from a, a budgeting and forecasting perspective. Can't continue to have you know finance going off in one direction and operations going off in another direction, and never the two will meet. Uh, that's that's clearly not going to get anybody anywhere. So, you know, as you can see, kind of the what we're building on is the the bottom half of this, which is really process efficiencies, which ultimately lead to better performance, right? Because if you have the processes in place, then the time and resources are available to do the other activities, such as the more strategic planning as well as getting more users involved in the process, such as the operational line level managers um, and in incorporating their data and and really using that data to drive the financial results. As everybody is painfully aware today, the most of most about what we are doing is spreadsheets, spreadsheets, and more spreadsheets. Right, everybody's in the the Excel world, and when you use spreadsheets to run your business, you you typically run into problems. Uh, some of those which we just touched on, which are lack of control. Right, you can put as many password protections and protecting sheets on, uh, and formulas on a on a worksheet, and somebody's going to find a way to uh, to get in there and and mess it up on you. And it's uh, I know in my past experience, it's happened many a times, and it's many a lost uh, hour trying to track that information down. And then if you just consider the the issues around accuracy and data quality, so whether it's somebody fat fingered a particular entry into an Excel sheet uh, and or the data load was not the most current information, you know, certainly those those cause issues that slow us down. And uh, and it, in the end, if, if you have a disconnected, um, you know, people processes and technology, then that, that continues to perpetuate a lot of the, the issues that we just talked about. And at the end of the day, if, if, if not only the mechanics of collecting the data, but also the mechanics of reporting take too long, then we, we have not uh, evolved to a point where we're actually serving our constituents who are the individuals across our company. And, and, it, and if we're not able to uh, interact with those constituents, that means that they are not taking ownership of the information that they need to provide within this the, the budgeting and planning process. So all of these items, uh, you know, included together is that it leads us to a point where we know we need to make a change and we know we need to evolve by a certain processes to, to help us be much more efficient. Um, and in really what we're going to be talking about today, and in, in that's what it pointed out here in this last point, is that we, we also have to realize that uh, the horizon with which we are looking at the data is not just a single year, but typically it's some other customized set, and that's depending upon your organization. So uh, it could be 15 months out, could be 18 months out, could be 24 months out, could be 5 or 10 years out, depending upon what type of uh, business you're in. I mean, Say, for example, oil and gas is a much more uh, a much longer horizon uh, that the companies are looking at, whereas a let's say a grow growing uh, tech company probably you know six months is probably more uh, of a more um, understood timeline for them to uh, to really make strategic decisions. So, getting to that, uh, getting to the the processes around that, we want to talk today about rolling forecasts. And just really quickly, I'm sure most people are familiar with the, the term, but just to, to give it a little bit of a definition and, and to kind of frame what we're going to discuss today, really what you can see is that everybody wants a crystal ball to be able to, to peer into the future. And for businesses that desire uh, becoming a, a top-notch organization, 
the necessity is to have a vision of the future that allows for not only better but more strategic decision making in the present term, right? So having that forward-looking mentality versus the uh, versus the backwards-looking mentality of the past. So rolling forecasts built on driver-based as well as project-based planning do just that. They create a framework that supports better decision making, fact-based decision making. And a rolling forecast simply means that each quarter or month a company projects four to six quarters or 12 to 18 months ahead. Or like I said, any custom period depending upon what the organization's industry is. And this allows executives and key decision makers to not only see both a financial and an operational vision of the future. It also will allow them to assess what their next steps are in the execution of their plan. So they can understand what the critical pivot points are meaning is the economy a pivot point or is it a particular commodity that's a pivot point? And based upon that, better judge the impact that that will have on their plan. Okay, so that's, that's what we're going to discuss today. And before we jump into some of the best practices that we see about rolling forecasts, uh, we want to just to highlight, and this is kind of the evolving, uh, the, the uh, continuing uh, discussion on the evolution of finance, really what's out and what's in. Okay, if we think about it, it's really about being forward-looking, right? It's about being multidimensional in our view of information. It's not just a cost center and account anymore. It's it's about really looking into the detail around other other uh, other considerations, such as you know how are my what is my product mix? What impact does that have on my financial results? Uh, how about my, my customers my, by region? What about uh, project-based planning that I'm doing? Or if I have uh, departmental uh, breakups within my cost center structure, you really how, how does that have an impact? And so it allows much more granular understanding of how the business is run. In, in addition, we're involving more people in the process, right? Through collaborative tools, technology provides a lot of collaborative tools that are available, uh, as well as making information available much faster allows more people to be involved in the process because they're not bogged down with either the education associated with that or the uh, the time that it takes to support uh, the the sheer number of individuals that are involved in the process. And, and lastly, it's about including operational and financial data in the system, in a single system that allows us to, to look at and discover trends around that information. So you, utilizing things like key performance indicators to measure that performance, not only on the financial data, but also on the, on the operational data as well. So moving on to the uh, discussion around uh, the discussion around our best practices. Before we jump into that, I mean, we as a as a company, Host Analytics has an opportunity to really be involved in hundreds of implementations a year, and and uh, we certainly understand from our customers what uh, what are the challenges that the customers are having, and what is the reason that they're investigating these tools. So we see all different type types and sizes of companies and. And really what we see is that many are planning on an annual basis. You know, my personal experience, you know, as Ernie mentioned, is that I came from a publishing company where we did just that. We spent at least five months a year planning for what the budget was going to be for the following year. And typically we didn't finish until after the first of the year. And so we, we spent pretty much the next 11 months or so trying to explain why the plan wasn't relevant anymore and, and that it can't be used as the basis for any variance analysis because that was done so long ago that it has no relevance whatsoever based upon the, the way that the market has changed. And in the end, we weren't able to change anything. It was static, right? It was it was something we had to live with, and, and we just kept explaining over and over the same things as to why the plan was not working for us. So as you move toward a, a rolling forecast, you, you'll begin to see the benefits of being able to modify the plan as the conditions require. And as such, we're going to walk through the, the nine best practices for rolling forecasts. And the first one is that we, do you need a system, okay? Um, you need a system, and Excel is not a system. It's a personal productivity tool, which is fantastic, and, and people utilize it, and, and finance, especially finance executives, will, will never walk away from that tool, and that's fine. 
but you, the recognition is that Excel is not that system that, uh, that will allow you to get to the efficiency that you need to to, uh, to really be a partner in the organization. So in the next uh, eight best practices, we'll, we'll outline what the functionality and practices are that will outstrip the capability of Excel spreadsheets. And the first, like I said, is that, um, you know, as far as the system is concerned, is that you need to have, um, when, when you're trying to ad adopt a rolling forecast methodology, it is in Excel, is you can't really keep it up to date because it's not just a single forecast. It's, it's an iterative forecast that's constantly changing. And, and Excel is not really a, a solid tool for utilizing that or, or for leveraging that, excuse me. And so if you consider once a baseline forecast is created, additional analysis and versions will, are going to be required to not, on, not only understand the impact of major and minor alterations to the plan, but also run the plan against different drivers. You know, what if I increase my spend by 10% or what if I cut headcount by 25%? Uh, you know, all those drivers need to be built into the system and, and modeled uh, effortlessly so that you can see what the different um, scenarios are and, and what the impacts of those are. You know, and, and so that's where a system really comes in is that it allows you to do that type of integrated, uh, integrated analysis, meaning you're not only collecting the data and you're preparing the data uh, based upon assumptions, but you're also running these iterations and then ultimately reporting the data out. So and then that's really where a system allows you to, to excel as an organization. So the next, uh, the next best practice is, is really understanding the, the broader objectives of the business. So you need to understand what the objectives are for creating a rolling forecast. Now it may sound obvious, of course, but our experience is that this is probably the most often overlooked item uh, as far as establishing a rolling forecast. But it's important as this will drive all of the other best practices related to rolling forecasts. So that you have to ask yourself a question. What, what are you truly, truly trying to accomplish by moving to a rolling forecast? While the overall objective of, of planning is to not only create a financial view of the future and to know the decisions you need to make, but it's also to understand the financial impact of those decisions before you need to make them. So ultimately, your objectives and the focus for the rolling forecast will dictate the areas of the plan that need more detail. So overall, you're, you're trying to get to a financial vision of the future that allows you to make these decisions. And as you grow and evolve, the, the, the logical next step is the understanding of the impact that those decisions have before you make them, right? So as we talked about the evolution from the beginning uh, of finance to now is that we're much more forward looking, right? We're trying to anticipate what is going to happen in the marketplace and we're trying to anticipate based upon not just theories and crystal balls, but based upon concrete information, what is going to happen not only in our business, but in the broader landscape that could be impacting our business. So if you consider uh, different things uh, like, you know, what, what are really the drivers behind the business, right? Is, is headcount a driver to your business? Let's say you're a services organization, very people intensive, and as such, you need to understand how, you know, increase and decrease in heads or the availability of skilled workers in the marketplace uh, truly has how that impacts your business. Uh, similarly, if your broader objectives are, are focused on acquisitions, then your forecasts and models need to take on a different view uh, to accommodate those acquisitions. You know, how do we roll new divisions into our company? How are we going to onboard these uh, these additional employees, and and are we going to keep the offices that they're currently in. You know, a lot of those strategic decisions need to be baked into your plan. Similarly, if expansion is your goal, you may be more focused on a capital structure. And lastly, let's say um, you have uh, you you have decisions around leasing versus buying. Let's say from a capital structure, uh, those are certainly things that you want to have baked into your plan so that you can understand how those how those objectives really uh, impact your business. Now the next, uh, you probably might say, is even more simple than the, the last one, but you need to identify what the rolling forecast duration is. And uh, But it's really critical that you give this some consideration up front to ensure that how you're defining that, uh, that forward-looking uh, period is 
related to the actual running of your business. Okay, so you, a couple questions you need to ask yourself is what is a relevant time period and what is an actionable time period? So is it going to be 12 months? Is it going to be 24 months? And then you also need to consider what is the frequency? Are you going to be performing a monthly forecast, a quarterly reforecast, re or some other custom length depending upon the nature of your business? And, uh, and to continue to, to really analyze and understand what the appropriate duration and frequency is, is you need to ask yourself some, some additional questions as, as far as, you know, what happens when we're one month into our plan? You know, what are, we, what are we going to do? Are we going to drop a month and then pick up a month, so do a true rolling forecast, uh, so that we're always looking out six quarters or 18 months out? Or are you, or are you going to have a fixed uh, end to your cycle, uh, meaning if it's 12 or 18 months out, that you continue to iterate down so that it's 17, 16, 15, 14 months, uh, so on down the line. And again, that, that really is personal preference. Uh, the majority of our customers that we see typically do a, a traditional rolling forecast, which is you drop one month and then you add another month. Um, the, the couple things to consider as you're determining what the, the actual duration of the, the period is, uh, is to, to really understand two things, both fluidity and uh, comparative purposes. So fluidity means, you know, how how does that data that is added, how does it affect the end of the window, meaning the end of the, the duration? It, it needs to be impactful. So if, for example, you are, you know, if sales 15 months out, for example, are dependent upon capital expenditures made today, then your planning time frame will need to at least go out 15 months. It may go out 18 months if, that, if there truly impacts beyond that 15-month window. Um, and, and then from a comparative perspective, it has to be referenceable, meaning you have to be able to report that back against some baseline. So as you're adding in actual information and dropping forecasts, that has to be, that has to be uh, comparative information so that you're looking at forecasts versus previous forecasts or forecasts against uh, actuals that were previously reported. Okay, so rolling into the next one, uh, we want to understand the, the related drivers, and drivers being uh, are, are absolutely key when you start thinking about more regularity in, in forecasting. So if you're planning annually, for example, and, and it's a once per year exercise, drivers are very important to uh, providing understanding and accountability for how the plan is being uh, driven. But they're not nearly as important as when you're forecasting and reforecasting on a regular basis. So when you think of the magnitude of the pieces of input that are involved in the process and you begin to touch those moving parts over and over again, it becomes much more cumbersome. So if you have 15 drivers, let's say from a budgeting perspective, and you're trying to hit all 15 drivers during the forecast and reforecast process, that could become a fairly lengthy exercise. So as you begin to forecast on a more regular basis, you need to begin to leverage those drivers that truly impact your business. And the use of drivers will help provide the flexibility in the planning process and also the agility when you replan or create alternate plans, right? So if you consider kind of the 80-20 rule that uh, from, a, from a budgeting or forecasting perspective, those drivers are the, the significant ones that are driving the 80% the of your business, right? And um, and so you want to understand what you can tweak in those drivers uh, so that you, you're not spending an inordinate amount of time going through the detail to understand all 80%. So you're just tweaking the drivers that impact that 80% as well as the key drivers that are focusing on the 20% the, the of your business. So um, it, it's not necessarily about getting to all, all of the detail, but it's really about hitting those those key items that not only are you going to impact your business off of, but what you're going to report off of as well. And so if you can consider uh, from engagement, meaning getting more individuals involved in the process, if you can offer a process whereby they are focusing on the, the key aspects of their business and they're not having to weed through every single line item that they created in the budget and, uh, and really put that forth in front of them, then that makes the adoption of the, uh, the rolling forecast that much more successful. And, and in the end, that allows them to be much more efficient managers because they're putting the focus on the things that really affect their portions of the business. 
allocations from corporate, for example. They can't affect those, so they should not be concerned about those. Those should just be drivers in the business that, that are provided to them uh, automatically. And over time, some of these drivers are going to be replaced as they are found to be either inconsistent in predictor of results and or there are stronger drivers that, uh, that become uh, available through analysis. And that's just the natural evolution. And, and that's a significant advantage of, of the rolling forecasting process because without that process, uh, either you as the, the finance executives or the, the line level managers would have never determined that, that those indeed were the, uh, uh, the true drivers behind the business. Now, on top of drivers, you, you also have uh, your standard uh, operational plans that may consist of larger initiatives. And, and if you consider these larger initiatives like capital and strategic uh, projects, uh, then you, you need to uh, find a way to section off these projects so that when you're analyzing the business, you can truly understand uh, what is the impact that these projects are, hand, are, are having across the organization? Uh, so they're, they're typically larger initiatives, meaning that they, they may not be you know, one month, two month, six month, eight month projects. They're probably grander initiatives, and, and they may be things like uh, you know, IT upgrades or uh, moving to a new corporate location or deciding to build a new plant or expanding into a particular geography that uh, hadn't uh, previously been uh, sold into. So we, we found that when companies are, are assessing these types of projects that it is better to have the ability to layer them into the plan. And what, what I mean by that is that to be able to consider them separately, right? Not have them mixed into other plans or spreadsheets that are floating around the business. So let's plan for, for these projects as, as a separate activity and then give ourselves the opportunity to ask, what if? What if we include it this year? What if we wait until next year? What if we include it this quarter or maybe we push it forward a quarter? What if this starts in April versus June or July? So when you think about rolling forecasts, this ability becomes even more important since you're making new assumptions every frequency period. So whether that's months, quarters, or, or weeks, where We've actually seen some of our customers do that. This ability to change to change the assumptions based upon these conditions, push out a month, pull back a month, consider it next year, is absolutely key in, in making better fact-based decisions. So as you start to look at the plan and start to break it out into its pieces, its distinct pieces, be sure to think about the capital or strategic projects that your business may be considering for the next year, because those can be built into a system very easily as distinct and separate uh, distinct and separate items not only from a uh, input perspective but also a reporting perspective so you can truly section out this is my core business and this is my core business plus these other projects and really do that modeling to help you determine what are the most effective decisions to be making now this next one is is probably my favorite and one that's most near and dear to my heart and I think Jim Collins probably said, said it best in his book, Good to Great. He said, first fire bullets and then cannonballs. So what does that mean? It means start with a small select group of key department operations managers and then continue to grow from there. So plan on increasing the scope over time and plan on continual improvement over time. While conventional wisdom is, is to involve as many participants as possible right from the get-go, and of course we've seen that happen many a time with our, with our customers, in the end, it, it's much more effective to start with a small group that cuts across the major departments, meaning you know, representative sample of all the departments that you want to have engaged, and gradually involve more individuals, line managers, operational managers, executives, as the processes and methods are, are refined. So in my, my past experience, we did the big bang approach. We, we said, all right, fantastic, we've got this brand spanking new technology, let's, let's get everybody on board and, and let's ram this home. And that project took two years to do. And it was just a basic budgeting uh, application. So we learned our lesson the second time. And what we did was we involved a very small set of users, kind of our, our key stakeholders, if you will. Uh, and we, we really tried to turn them into evangelists 
across the organization. So we started with a, a small group, a pilot group, if you will, of six to eight individuals. And we went through the, the design process and had took their input, designed the, the model, went through an iteration with them, so went through a quarterly forecast with them. And the key thing was establishing a feedback loop. So as we were going through the process, they were continually providing feedback on what was working, what wasn't working. And we took the information, continually evolved it because we were in an iterative planning cycle, which was perfect, and continually evolved it so that we were meeting, kept meeting their needs a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more as the process went on. When we got done with that pilot, we had eight evangelists that were very happy with what we had produced, and they were willing to go out and convince others that this was the best way to do uh, the, re the reforecasting process within our organization. Now, this was tremendous for us because, as a finance organization, because we were able to not be the heavy-handed, you know, uh, drop the fist and everybody uh, has to do what you say, but we enabled individuals to go out and, and to do that in a much softer approach for us. And not only that, but we also learned from the process and we were able to put in the appropriate processes and, and uh, procedures and, and information that people were looking for to allow them to be successful. Now going along with, uh, with kind of starting small, it, in the same vein, we also want to consider creating a baseline plan. And you know, the concept of creating a baseline is is really, in our experiences, that most companies we speak with rush to the end of the planning cycle, right? There's no concept of a baseline because there's no concept of alternatives, right? It takes so many resources to finalize a plan to measure the business against that, you know, they're just happy to be done with the one version. So as you begin to think about the processes and the tools that you're using to evaluate and to help you get there, it will be important to begin to think about creating a baseline and to iterate with it. So use it as a vehicle to help understand the impacts of decisions before you make them, not just what the current financial view is. So we can really consider the rolling forecast as the baseline plan, right? You need to have something to, to jump off against. So this could be the budget, it could be a rolling forecast, whatever it happens to be. There has to be something that that, comp that uh, the, the individual managers are constantly going to be going back against. And once you've, you've completed a, you know, a rolling forecast for a period or a month and are using that as the baseline plan, from this, you know, finance can start to massage some drivers and adjust values and analyze alternate scenarios, black swan events, and then potential significant events. Uh, whether they be acquisitions, mergers, uh, you know, economic conditions, whatever they might be, to, to create a picture of the alternate futures and be prepared to make decisions if those situations arise. Right? So, so having that starting point, that point to, to continually go back to, is important for not only finance, but also for all of the, um, the individuals that are involved in the process because they have that jumping off point. They have that, um, that, uh, that initial starting point that allows them to do the modeling and always come back and, and build off of that to create the most effective uh, plan based upon the, the, different, the different environments that are impacting them, whether they be external to the organization, such as economic conditions, co competition, or whether they be internal, so availability of resources or technology or, um, let's say, expansion within the company or, or whatever it happens to be. The, there always has to be that baseline that you can go back to to allow you to jump off and, and be more strategic as you move forward. Now, the, the next one is, is tying to strategic plans. So this is very similar to kind of the previous one where we talked about creating a baseline plan. But for strategic plans, traditionally in the past, strategic plans have been kind of done off in a silo, right? A small number of individuals theorizing about where the company is going and setting that direction and reporting that to, to management or the board or, or whomever and saying that this is where we're going to go. And then it kind of ended there. There was no tie back to the actual financial plan that was being put in place to ultimately get you to those, uh, to those objectives. And so the key thing to understand there is that that, that link truly impacts 
how effective an organization can be in terms of how they set up their forecasting methodology. If at the end of the day there is no tie back between the strategic plan and the and the forecasting plan, then then users are going to be creating things that that may or may not be furthering the direction of the company. So having the strategic plan integrated with the uh, within the forecasting process, meaning the rolling forecasting process, uh, either as targets for uh, objectives to meet uh, or the drivers that are being utilized in the strategic plan are communicated to the the rolling forecast plan as drivers within the, the forecasting plan then that allows those the, the two uh, one siloed uh, processes to become integrated and interwoven so that the strategic plan can be uh, as it states much more strategic so as as the the rolling forecasting process evolves and the drivers that are that were established for the strategic plan are being used in the rolling forecast. And there are things that are being discovered, such as we're not going to meet this plan, or we're going to be well ahead of plan, and we may want to consider some different uh, usage of our resources. Then the, the, uh, the, the strategic plan can be much more uh, fluid and effective and allow companies to be much more agile. So. Uh, the beauty of systems is the ability to pull in the strategic plans in with the rolling forecast and really leverage a single system to get you to that point. Now the last uh, item that I wanted to talk to you about today is, is leveraging external conditions. So as we're all painfully aware of uh, from what happened in uh, you know, the early 2000s uh, with the crash of the, the market as well as uh, 2008, uh, the housing crisis, there are conditions that are external to our company that have a significant impact on our business, whether they be directly impactful, such as uh, commodity prices or competition or, um, uh, let's say, performance of different markets, geographic markets. You also have the broader you know, macroeconomic environment that certainly has an impact on your business. And um, this is something that, that very few finance teams that, that we are seeing are taking advantage of, but it's a huge opportunity. So consider this example. You, fly, you finalize your, your, uh, your yearly budget and you have some fantastic news. You grew the business by 35% while margins increased 15%. Great, great results. So we just exceeded our plan. Our plan was accurate, of course, because we exceeded it and therefore we exceeded all of our goals. Everybody's smiling, patting themselves on the back. Here comes the bad news. As we grew by 35%, our two main competitors grew by 50%, and their margins were up by 20 points. So all of a sudden, our results don't look that fantastic after all. So this is another area where most finance departments don't have the time or the tools to consider what the rest of the market is doing and how they will, will affect their plan. So this is, a, this is a great example of what can be accomplished. Uh, one of our customers using a host analytics tool called Decision Hub is able to pull in external data through Edgar Online, who reports all of the, basically all the SEC submissions to the, the Edgar database, and looks at his four biggest competitors. Not only does he benchmark against these competitors on financial metrics, such as, you know, top line revenue, uh, margin, expenses, but he also takes that, that data and the margins and flushes them through his plan. So he's basically able to answer the question, if we had their margins, what would our bottom line look like? So this provides tremendous amount of context to his own plan and allows him to walk into discussions with management, with the board, and be much more confident in his ability to explain what the direction of the company should be. Okay, so there's a wealth of information that's out there, and it's at people's fingertips. And so leveraging the system that in it, interacts with that data and allows you to consume that data, not only informs the, uh, the individual reforecasts and plans, but also gives that justification for making the, the, the strategic decisions as well. So in summary, as, as I talked about, the system is key and you really need to focus on uh, ensuring that your objectives are well defined up front and that you have the appropriate duration and comparative periods defined in your system so that you can get the reporting out that you need to that is meaningful and impactful, so the decisions that you're making can truly be, get you to that next level. 
and that you really understand the, the drivers behind the business and how those drivers will, uh, will impact the performance. And, and really understand what is a, a good number of drivers uh, for you to, to really try to impact within a forecasting cycle. As well as ensuring that you can, you can strip out these, these larger projects and uh, report on them distinctly so that you can understand the core business versus these, uh, these more uh, long range projects uh, that, and what the impact of that has on the business. And again, start small, start small, start small. Uh, because that is going to get you to success a lot faster than trying to do the big bang approach. And uh, in the last three items, basically tying your rolling forecast as your base, as your baseline plan, and ensuring that the, the strategic plan is tied in with the forecasting process, so that the drivers that are leveraged in both make sense and that they're utilized effectively. And lastly, that you're you're accessing information that is external to your organization that will allow you to make those better fact-based decisions. So with that, I, I thank you very much for your time today, and I'm going to turn it over to Ernie. Thank you very much, uh, Brian, for that insightful content. Um, now we're going to go ahead and launch our polling questions. Uh, we would love to have everyone uh, on our audience today participate in the polling question. The more options you have, the better. And note that we share the benchmarking information on Proformative.com. Uh, for those of you who are in the audience for CPE credit, you need to make sure that you answer both uh, of our polling questions. I'm going to go ahead and launch the polling questions as we begin our Q&A so we can take full advantage of our opportunity uh, to leverage uh, Brian's extensive knowledge and experience. So, uh, and, and then... Uh, and then again, if you have a question you would like to have answered, uh, please go ahead and ask it um, in the control panel uh, for us there. So uh, Brian, um, you mentioned, um, go ahead and ask our uh, uh, first question um, here. Uh, it seems as if, it seems as if uh, there's been kind of a resurgence in people looking um, at rolling forecasts. What, what would you say are the conditions um, in the marketplace uh, you know, that, are, that are inspiring people to take another look um, at the rolling forecast. Uh, are the economics changing um, on some level, or what do you think is driving that? Uh, that's a good question, Ernie. I think there's, there's probably two key things. One, uh, which I touched upon in the, in the presentation, which is the, the fact that the world is changing at the speed of thought, and, and as such, the, the budgeting, traditional budgeting process and or forecasting processes that companies have engaged in in the past uh, are are really becoming out out of date so quickly that it's it's hard for them to to make decisions uh, about where to take their business uh, because the information that they're utilizing is, is very stale and rolling forecasts by nature uh, allow companies to have much more of a uh, real time as well as proactive uh, view into the future and and companies realize to stay competitive that they need to have that. And I would say the second thing is that technology is evolving, right? There are systems that are out there that are enabling companies to not only get the information on a more real-time basis, but allow them to give them tools uh, to uh, analyze that data so that the, uh, the inputs that are, are coming into the systems are much more in, uh, informed throughout the process so that at the end, when they're reporting the, the information out, that they have better uh, justification and assumptions that are utilized along the way, as well as, in, in certain instances, they're actually incorporating uh, much more data that helps inform, uh, again, those decisions that they didn't traditionally have in the past. So the combination of those two, I think, are probably the two biggest drivers behind the consideration for rolling forecasts. Okay, great. Um, someone's asking about um, what are uh, what are some of the downsides uh, downside of that you would see to potentially moving to a rolling forecast for companies. Well, I would say implement it effectively. Uh, I I don't see uh, many downsides to to having more information uh, to base your decisions off of. <laughs> I, I say that kind of flippantly, but it's but it's true. Uh, it, you know, having from a, if I if I consider kind of worst case scenario, I would say that if it was not done properly, then then certainly that could be a, a black mark on the organization, meaning the finance organization, if it was not adopted properly or, and or rolled out properly. 
uh, you know, leveraging the best practices that we discussed today, that that could certainly have a, a an impact to the finance organization. But but I think if you leverage the uh, the best practices that, that we discussed, there there really is not a downside because having putting the information not only into the hands of those that should be accountable for it, meaning pushing that down throughout the organization, but also making more information available that is relevant and actionable is is only a good thing for organizations. Okay, great. Um, can you give us a little more uh, insight? Um, someone's asking. Uh, you you mentioned you know how there are how people are uh, uh, there's the ability uh, to look at um, external conditions and external uh, drivers. What are the you know what what are what are some of the things uh, again that that people um, are looking at other than straight financial statements and how are they pulling that in into, this, into a system. Sure, sure. So we, uh, so within host analytics, we have uh, just to, to use a couple examples. We have the ability to, we'll start simple to to pull in currency rates. So programmatically, so uh, customers can get uh, currency rates real time and do some modeling off of those currency rates uh, to to uh, determine you know hedging strategies and or uh, ability to move into different markets. Let's say that they might be considering. Then uh, you know building on top of that. We also provide information such as leading and lagging uh, indicators, and so these are both financial as well as operational indicators. And so there's there's a lot of uh, uh, data vendors that are out there, and you can get information, let's say, such as consumer price index information or producer price uh, information, as well as consumer sentiment information, uh, housing starts. Uh, those uh, indicators that can be used to help model uh, what your business is. So let's consider your um, let's let's consider you're a security company and you do uh, home installation security systems. Well, the number of of new homes that are being built uh, is certainly a driver of uh, could be a driver of your business. So utilizing indicators like that to help inform in certain geographies what your expected business could be. Is uh, is one way to leverage those indicators. Uh, another type of external information that we pull in that I kind of touched on in the presentation is financial metrics, meaning income statements and balance sheets, but also uh, key metrics uh, based upon those financial statements. So, what is your asset turnover? What is your uh, you know compared to your competition? And um, in really taking that information and again helping inform your decisions. And then lastly, uh, having access to KPIs and how to set up KPIs so that you can most effectively uh, monitor the performance of your organization and really push that down to the people that are have responsibility for managing those those key uh, indicators. So if you consider you know key performance indicators of let's say in the healthcare world, uh, bed turnover in hospitals, let's say, so hospital administrators. You know, should be able to know what that what their turnover is on a on a frequent basis, and they should be uh, monitored. Meaning, from a performance perspective, if you're talking pay, that's certainly one one thing to look at. But also, just operationally, how efficient are you running your your hospital? So that's just a few examples of uh, different type of information that is available that can be consumed in. Uh, in, in these CPM systems to, to help you not only plan more effectively, but also make those better decisions. Okay, great. Um, someone's just kind of asking, you know, um, the, around the uh, robustness uh, of the systems, are there systems, you know, that, that handle, handle, you know, multi-currency, uh, multi-size, multiple subsidiaries, or the, is there sophistication out there, and, and is that, are the economics of, of those the same? So I would say, in, you know, in the marketplace, there's, you know, most most of the vendors handle uh, the the ability to do multi-currency. Um, as far as uh, obtaining information from, let's say, you know, multiple source systems, again, most most systems have the ability to do that. Um, if you're doing uh, budgeting as well as consolidations, as well as analysis and reporting. Then you start to have some divergence in terms of the, the uh, capabilities of uh, some of the CPM systems that are out there. But uh, it, you know the main attributes are that you know you should be able to do multi-currency, so you know basically global uh, planning 
and uh, have workflow associated with that so that you can certainly manage a, a global workforce uh, as well as uh, having the ability to do things like uh, scheduling loads, whether they be data loads and or um, loads to your your metadata, your, your account structure, if you will. And, uh, and then typically within the budgeting applications themselves, you have all kinds of uh, modeling capabilities. So the ability to do the what if scenarios and, and take some of those assumptions like we talked about before, you know, what happens if I take this plant and instead of building it uh, in 2012, I built it in 2013 and what does that do to my plan? Uh, and then at the end of the day, of course, everybody needs to report the information out. So having robust uh, reporting tools, uh, both from a presentation style as well as ad hoc reporting tools so you can do that quick and dirty analysis. Uh, and then lastly, having you know reporting tools that allow you to aggregate content from both internal, uh, meaning within the CPM system, as well as external uh, outside of uh, CPM system. So, you know, Host Analytics has a tool called Executive Report Manager that allows you to do just that. Take your financials from within your CPM system as well as pull in external data like we were talking about, whether they be the benchmark information or uh, pull in data from other systems and, and combine that together into a, a final presentation report. So those are some of the, the key attributes of, uh, of systems that are out there. And, and like I said, it, it varies widely. Uh, in terms of what uh, what characteristics each vendor has, but uh, you know certainly you can certainly reach out to Performative has a fantastic uh, wealth of knowledge on on different systems that are out there and uh, and a good core of individuals who have are uh, who have used and or are currently using those systems to to determine more information about that. Okay, uh, thank thank you very much, Brian. With be mindful of our time, we have to get and go ahead and uh, close our. Uh, Q&A session. Um, just a logistical note, um, we had one of our polling questions and the other polling question we had an issue with, so we didn't, weren't able to relaunch that. Just to make that note, several questions coming in about that. Um, we'd like to thank Brian for his time and insight. If you'd like us to connect with Brian, please indicate that on the survey we'll ask you to take immediately, including the webinar. Brian is a leader in his field and an excellent source of information on today's topics. Uh, thanks again to uh, Host Analytics. Um, who's committed thought leadership to a lot of what this has been on today. If you have any questions regarding our CP credits, please email Tanya Walsh, twalsh at performative.com. Again, please note after we conclude the web, and I'll be prompted to take a short survey. We always want to maximize the ROI that we offer uh, for our attendees at each and every one of our events. Uh, finally, I'd like to thank everyone um, in the audience um, for, their, for their valuable time, and we hope to see you all on uh, at future events and on performative.com. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you very much.